Okay, good morning. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. There's Nerman. All right. Okay, so for now, it's just the four of us or whoever ends up coming in as well, sharing. Good morning, Nerman. Good morning. Hey, I saw your, your uh, little message. That That's great. That's great. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, actually, I spent uh, almost all day, like, setting up uh, that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, well, I, 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 would, I would love it love if you could share about, about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can do it. Whenever you're ready, you just let me know. I will share my screen and... Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, let me see if I, I give you any special... special uh, um, I need to make, make your presenter. So I'm just looking for. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, there it is. Uh, okay, you, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, my uh, firewall watch guard uh, full uh, firewall security and uh, <clears throat> this is uh, actually let me go back so this is uh, my firewall dashboard and uh, as you can see here like it's my firebox firebox license so it, mm -hmm. it has the expiration date I have one only one firewall connected only one license um, okay. Okay. Um, Hold on, Norman. Oh, while we're seeing, we're seeing your, your uh, background, background screen. Oh. Oh, hold on, hold on. Remember when you share, you yeah, hit Yeah, I made a mistake. I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Okay, share. And then down on the side, items to share. Um, if you click the checkbox at the very top, it'll... Yeah, I see now. I got it. Apply changes. There we go. Okay. Yep, we're looking at it. You see it now? Yes, it says alerts oh. five. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, this is my... Uh, Firewall, I mean dashboard uh, for my firewall, firebox. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, I, uh, as you can see, here is my license. So I have only one device, only one firewall, only one box, one device. This is expiration date of my license. And uh, <clears throat> I will just keep some things like quickly go over. Um, so here is my uh, auth authentication point. Uh, FMA, so I will go there in a second. Um, is uh, my endpoint security license? So the uh, WatchGuard they have a VPN, so you you can purchase separate license for VPN for endpoint security. So the endpoint security, it's an end, end, endpoint detection and response. So that's a full security. They have a patch management, full uh, full disk en encryption. Uh, they have some advanced reporting tools and uh, mu much more. Um, and then um, you can also buy license uh, for uh, auth authentication point, uh, FMA. So this is the one that I have. And I have, um, oh, this is just free trial. Um, I'm just trying to see how that works. But yeah, I, I, I can add like 250 users. Uh, so yeah, yesterday I did, I just add one. So if I go here, I can go to that. This is the FMA um, dashboard, and as you can see, I have some only one um, user and only one uh, group. <clears throat> and you you can see here, like so, they said like one successful authentication. I just logged in my uh, other uh, PC and. Um, I will go to uh, configuration. Okay, so yeah, so here, here's like you can see, like it's only one group. 
and th this group has only one user and uh, I will go to so there is like and this this window you can add uh, add uh, create your group and when you create your group you can go back to add to user to that group so I already have one group it's called Nero one and then I add one user and as soon as you add your user uh, so that user will uh, get email so when you add user and you put users uh, email address user will get email and uh, user will get two emails so one email is to create a password uh, and the other email is to activate um, um, to activate uh, authentication point and when you activate your FMA you will be able to install uh, um, app on your uh, cell phone and you will automatically get your token so uh, um, as I'm looking at it this control panel is cloud-based right yes it's not a local install no no but it's but not. it does allow you to install things like a local authenticator is that what you're yeah. saying yes so I, I, I will go through like quickly so, <clears throat> so I can just add group so this is how that works you add group um, so you first add group and then you go to add <coughs> user uh, the user um. mm. I and then so yeah, so this is the group that I so this user is going to uh, uh, to belong this new group that I just created so I, I create a new group and then I can go to resources so here I can add um, for example for this group I can I can add um, logon app so this one you will use like uh, for like for example for Facebook so you want to use this this group this uh, particular user for for Facebook and then you go to add resources uh, I just need to go see let me just go back sorry so uh, and resources and see so for example like if you now for this device device that I'm using mm -hmm. so I can go back to uh, resources click back um, should here so show them uh, I don't know why it doesn't show like uh, the link so uh, I will come, give me just a second uh, I'll just use this one to show you. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, it doesn't show me a link, so it should. It's supposed to show me uh, the link, but probably because I already used. But I will explain to you. So when you cre create your group, you add. Uh, you can add many users to to one group. And each user will receive email, um, two emails, as I said, like one to create password and the other one to activate uh, authentication point. And then the user will install app on cell phone and and get um, automatically will get the token. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, for example, that user can I, I did for my laptop. So <clears throat> this is my first device this is my second device so um, 
So I download the, the, the configuration file and on my laptop. And so th that way, like every time when I uh, put password uh, to log in in my laptop, I will get uh, uh, authentication. I, I will get notification on my uh, cell phone, on my app to confirm uh, login. So that's two-way authentication. And um, I will show you. I don't know. Can you still see me on, on the screen? Um, I see your, I mean, we're looking at the WatchGuard AuthPoint screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so probably I have to stop sharing. When I stop sharing, I will show you the app. But yeah, basically, so you can create many groups, So give, uh, which means like you can um, give uh, like uh, access to multiple people, like more, more users, multiple, multiple users. And then you can uh, here like add uh, authentication policy and you can say, uh, what what can each user can have like so you have here OTP password uh, QR code or push notification so I select all all of those all all options for all the uh, devices because you're trying it right now right yeah yeah because I'm trying now um, want to see how that works I'm still learning I, I don't I I just yesterday set up but it works like so I set up like um, two-way authentication for all my devices. So every time when I log in my devices, I will also get, um, when I put password, I will also get notification on my uh, cell phone. And uh, I will show you later. And uh, um, for example, I also um, add a um, uh, token to my uh, app for um, Facebook. So you can add third-party token. So you just uh, scan a QR and uh, you will uh, it will automatically add the token and every time when you log for example in facebook you put your password and then <clears throat> facebook will ask you to 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 type in token so you go back to your uh, uh app and you will see the at the moment the the token the number for your Very good. facebook um and again, like so, you can uh, you you can have uh, tw uh, 250 users. Uh, you can have many groups, and uh, each group can have many users. And then, I, as I said, like here is the add policy. You can adjust policy. Like you can add also uh, maybe uh, add some uh, uh, IP addresses or uh, websites that can be uh, that you don't want to use two-way authentication. For your users, so if you you want to allow your users to go to um, for uh, uh, to go to YouTube, for for instance, mm -hmm. so you can add uh, YouTube there, and then it will not require two-way authentication if you want to bypass that. Um, so yeah, the policy is like you you adjust like what you want them to see, what they want, how to log. Uh, to give them access for specific websites, uh, specific uh, IP addresses, specific de devices, mm -hmm. so, uh, specific uh, applications, uh, and then you can adjust for each group, for each user separately. Okay. Um, okay, I will go, just go back. Um, let's see. And this is the free trial version, right? Yeah, I just uh, I'm using the free free trial. Yeah, because I didn't know how that works. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, I mean, it's a little bit com complicated because it's it's the part of uh, fire, fire firewall. Uh, it's not like separate like um, you know you can just pu purchase like some uh, software like. Mm -hmm. FMA, like so, you know, just separately. So this is the part of the the, the whole thing, Watch Guard, uh, and um, the setup. It's a little bit uh, kind of complicated, but I made it. Yeah, yesterday I was watching some YouTube videos, and it, it's working. So now today I'm going to add uh, uh, to add talking for some other uh, applications that I'm using. Um, nice. I will stop uh, sharing the screen and. Um, Oh, speaking of tokens, while we're talking about it, if any of you are working on your Security Plus, uh, I went in and look, looked at it this morning. Oh, we lost Nerman. Um, anyway, if you're looking, uh, if you're studying for your Security Plus, uh, one thing that they did point out, they uh, say that in 
the exam, they don't call it a token. They typically call it a token key. So uh, if you're thinking about like a physical access token or, or anything like that, in your exam, it's likely going to be called token key. So just, uh, I just grabbed that this morning when I was looking in my uh, exam book. Uh, so, and Nerman's on his way back. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, quickly I will show you. Yeah, so this is the, okay, so as you can see here is the app. So if you click, so I have my uh, token for my devices and for Facebook. And you know this, like every time when you close the app, the token will change automatically. So the numbers will change um, periodically. Um, and then... Um, so here is the option. You can scan uh, QR, QR code. QR code. So you can also um, choose to migrate your tokens to a new device if you want. And here is the other some op option: token security. So uh, there's yeah. Here is like manually. You can manually activate token if you want. Like maybe you can. Uh, copy and paste the link and just mm -hmm. insert there like so and then here is the option to use the third party tokens like Facebook or some other mm -hmm. applications. So what so is, what the, is actual the actual name, name of the authentication uh, I'm sorry can you say that again? Uh, what is, what the, is name the name of that, of that app? app? Oh, um, it's called uh, uh, authentication point but it's the part of uh, WatchGuard so I'm yeah, using yeah. WatchGuard T15 Firewall. So it's a software and hardware. So I have the box and also I have the software installed on, on, my, on, on all my devices. Mm -hmm. And then they have a different license. So uh, Firewall, I have a full, full, full uh, security firewall. But then you can add, uh, add some other licenses like endpoint security. Uh, I mentioned that you can add a FMA, so I did yesterday. You can add a VPN license, so, but you have to purchase separately those licenses. Uh, once you purchase, you go back to your uh, WatchGuard firewall and you activate those licenses. And then on the dashboard, you will see your firewall, you will see your endpoint security, you will see your VPN, you will see your uh, FMA. So they're separate licenses, separate uh, softwares, but they're attached to your uh, firewall. So you yeah. and then you can other. monitor for each one. You can have a dashboard, and for each one you can do like configuration. So you can just you know go there and do some setup. So this would be helpful for like a small business setup. Well, the the one the one that I bought actually it's for small office. So uh, like let's say like five, six uh, devices, um, but the next one it's, it's going to be for like some big business. So this one was about like thousand, a little bit less than $1,000. Uh, so, but yeah, so this is like home, home use and s small business. Right, right. Very cool. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. How do you like it so far? Oh, I really like it. I really like it. I mean, um, uh, it's really good if you purchase all those licenses. So today I'm going to set up my VPN. I'm I'm using VPN uh, through my uh, antivirus uh, mm -hmm. Defender, but I'm going to set up this one instead, uh, Defender. So, and uh, yeah, it's amazing if you purchase all, all those licenses. It's 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 really good. Like and Firewall, it's amazing. Like I already tested many times. So I was uh, using. You remember that we spoke about uh, Kali Linux and those tools. So I was using Nmap, using my um, IP address, and uh, it it works. It works. So like the Firewall is working. Like so there, there there wasn't like open port any open port. It says filtering, so it doesn't show anything. So I I checked. Very good. It's good. Though. Very nice. All right. So um, that that looks like fun. Uh, keep us surprised on it.
Chris, are you uh, familiar with this uh, uh, application? Actually, I'm not familiar. It's something yeah. new Watch to it. learn. It's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whatever you find, Nerman, please share with us. We'd love to watch your yeah. progress on it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something. I just started. Like, so to be honest, I don't know how to. I, even the Fireball, I'm still like, it's a lot of options. And I'm still trying to, to learn how to set up everything, how to do some configuration, like on Fireball, on all, all those uh, separate soft softwares. And, uh, yeah, as soon as I figure out, like, get more information, I will let you know. Uh, yeah. Well, Sure. sure. Would like that very much. Cool. So um, I notice we have Ron and Harminder on, and Harminder, it looks like you're at work. So uh, I realize if you know if you don't show up, that's fine. But thank you for joining us. Yes, um, I am. Thank you. Yeah, Ron, it looked like you were traveling, so uh, I really appreciate you stopping on. So um, did anybody else have? Oh, Chris, you had something to share from. Uh, uh, and by the way, everybody, as we're talking about this, remember our homework assignments. The homework assignment is if you're out in the world and you come up with something and say, hey, there's a cybersecurity implication to that, bring it back to us so that we can all share about it because we're probably watching it as well. And uh, it helps everyone increase your awareness of just how um, integrated cybersecurity is in society these days. Okay, that's why the homework is out there. I'm not trying to be a, you know, make you do things. I'm trying to help you tune your mind so that when you're, you know, walking down the street or looking at the TV or you go to the movies or whatever, you emerge thinking about what just occurred from a cybersecurity standpoint. That's the mindset of the provider. Okay, so Chris, you had something to share. So I was out on a date with my wife and saw the movie The Lost City uh, with Sean, Sandra Bullock and uh, Channing Tatum, and there was a cybersecurity impl implication in the movie, and Sean Bullock had a smartwatch with, with, that was connected to a cell phone, and Without giving too much of the plot away, Sandra Bullock gets kidnapped by a bunch of uh, people looking for treasure. The Her personal assistant and her um, supervisor was looking all over for her. And Sa Sandra Bullock's boyfriend, played by Chance Tatum, said, I met this guy in the military, and he's very good with technology. So they called him up, and they, and they said, well, do you have her phone? And they go, no, the phone's with us. It, it, was she wearing any other technology? She was wearing her smartwatch. She had location on on her smartwatch. She was able to look look up on the phone after the uh, after the uh, expert said, hey, why don't you look up the app on the phone to see where she is? And they actually found her location on the phone. A little bit Hollywood lies, but it was just a great great general. Just keep your radar up with cybersecurity implication. Very cool. Yeah, a, a lot of people don't recognize that. Um, I did a, uh, I've got this, you know, little Wise watch, really inexpensive. It was $29 or something. But on it is a an app for uh, my walking. Uh, I don't know if you can see it because everything's so bright. But there's an app in here for walking. And I was thinking, well, um, as I'm going from here to there, how does it tell where I've gone? And in my case, because this is only a $29 watch, all it does, it's got the accelerometer in here, and it measures my footsteps, you know. So this doesn't have GPS, but like Chris pointed out, these guys do. So, um, and, and the smarter watches, the more expensive ones do as well. Um, so it literally, you know, you think about your phone, but then there's also the other computer you wear. So very good point. Great. Uh, and it's, it's kind of cute when you're watching a movie and something occurs that's sort of like novel to many people, but you're like, yeah, I know about that. 
you know, it, it helps you understand that you're on the right track when it comes to uh, cybersecurity and information assurance and those sorts of things. So very good share, Chris. Did anybody else have anything to share before I went into our uh, little presentation for today? Harminder, Ron, anything else from you, Nerman? Nope? Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, I hope everybody can see that. The, it says multi-factor authentication. You guys seeing that? Okay, good. Appreciate it. Uh, so anyway, the reason I'm doing MFA again, and you, you hear me, I will, I will typically do themes that go through everything. One is critical infrastructures. One is multi-factor authentication. Uh, we could you could hear me talking about ports and protocols. Those things, for all intents and purposes, they should pop up everywhere in your experience because they are how bits and bytes get around. So, you know, that, that's what we're responsible or we're becoming responsible for protecting. Um, I may talk about uh, CIA triads confidentiality, integrity, and availability. If you guys don't have those uh, ironed into your minds yet, that's um, a great place to start. Learn about CIA, what it means, and why it's so important. Uh, Chris, uh, you were just out on USA Jobs. If you're doing something for cybersecurity or InfoSec or whatever, how many times do you see confidentiality, integrity, and availability listed in the descriptions or experience required? Right now, as I pull, but I might be, I have a narrow filter right now. Mm -hmm. it, I don't see much in the way of that. Okay. Uh, I'm also focusing my, my hunt on something else, mm -hmm. but I bet you if I find out and go from there, I bet you I'll find it a few times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nerman. I just want to add something like when you when you ask Chris how many times does he see the uh, CIA, CIA trade? So yeah, I, I see that like um, almost like um, in every my in each class or so every class because all my classes are there regarding cybersecurity. So in each book they mention CIA, CIA trade and they always repeat the the, the meaning of CIA. Yeah. Trade. yeah, it's very important. Chris. Nerman just Thank reminded me of something. Um, in my studies, my, my off time studies, every single certification track, every single vendor certificate that I'm interested in, they talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It's almost they want to drill it into your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. So that's why I'm saying like I and it was kind of funny. Like so, I was thinking like. Why I have to see this all the time, like in every book, in every class, even it's like, I don't know, like regarding something like database, like, uh, you know, like they always mention that because, yeah, that's the security, like, so it's provide like, so, um, yeah, yeah. like so this, I just want to add one. And availability. Yeah. yeah, Harminder, go ahead. In the cybersecurity, there is a three main things, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Because these are the three main aspects of the cybersecurity. Whatever job we are doing, wherever we are working, and what is the position and role of your job, we have to focus on all these three aspects. This is very That's important. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Very good. Yeah, you can't focus on one and think that you're being effective. They all work together, and um, all three are areas that require protection. And, you know, you've got to have processes in place, etc. So if you think about it, uh, if any of you have ever been in sales or, or anything like that, the CIA triad, a great way to think about it is that's your why. In other words, why am I doing cybersecurity? Why is cybersecurity important? Um, you know, it's not just like 
somebody decides they're going to paint their house blue, so blue is the color they're thinking about. No, this is essential to understanding and therefore trying to focus your mind on am I protecting the confidentiality in this manner? Am I protecting the integrity in this manner? Am I protecting the availability and making sure that the data is available when it's requested, etc.? So they're all important, and I think about it as my why. So, Chris. Oh, no, 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 I'm reading something. Sorry, keep going, Scotty. Oh, that's okay. So uh, I wanted to step into this. ZDNet.com had a uh, an article. I catch articles, and when I see something that I think has applicability or maybe it expands on something we've already discussed or whatever, uh, I tend to bring it in here. And this one was from ZDNet, and they basically said, uh, oh, we'll talk about it in just a second, but they said, is SMS-based MFA uh, still good? SMS-based. But uh, let's start off with, you know, is MFA essential? Well, here are two, uh, I would say, industry leaders. Uh, Verizon says compromised passwords are responsible for 81% of hacking-related breaches. In other words, if you can practice good password, passcode, passphrase, authentication, hygiene, you will have made your accounts 80% better than just a regular user ID and password where you think about, oh, what's my dog's name or something like that, okay? And then also Microsoft, you know, is quoted as saying that multi-factor authentication makes your account, and I think they actually said 99.9% .9 more secure than a user ID and a password. So, yeah. <laughs> Should you do it? Yeah. <laughs> so ZDNet in their um, article, they said, I know I'm supposed to use two-factor authentication for everything. That includes us, people. Two-factor authentication for everything. But I keep reading that using text messages for 2FA is dangerous. Do I really need to worry about this? What are my alternatives? So um, are any of you aware of the uh, possible uh, issues involved with um, MFA using SMS texts. The reason why this comes up at ZeniNet, there's this thing called, um, uh, oh gosh, I don't even remember what it's called, but they can go in and hijack SMS data because SMS data is transmitted electronically it is possible for somebody to monitor SMS data streams because they're, they're out on wireless. Um, so uh, back in the good old days, like you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they used what were called pager networks, and they were totally unencrypted. Uh, and if you remember Twitter, uh, just a side trip here, you remember why Twitter how long was the how long were you allowed to do a tweet? How long was the tweet allowed to be in Twitter originally? Was it just 140 characters, Scotty? Yep, 140. Does anybody know why? I've heard different things. The main thing I heard was you could not necessarily lie on 140 characters. It was hard to do. That was the okay. one thing I heard, but All I right. don't know if that's true or not. It goes back to the prior to, uh, you know, Wi-Fi and all that sort of thing, it goes, goes back to the length of a packet in a paging oh. network. And that, that would allow 140 characters plus the addressing, plus, you know, any sort of authentication or whatever, the overhead, but you were allowed 140 characters. And so that is how Twitter began. Twitter originally was a thought to use something other than internet packets, and it was built on paging packets. 
anyway, just a you know quick little side trip. Yeah, Nerman. Uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I have a question. So does that mean that uh, because it, uh, those one 140 characters will be able to fit in in one packet? So so the when so it will be the pa packet will not be divided. It will be sent like as a whole one packet. That's correct. Right. Yeah, that that's, was the original intent. Yeah, because I know packets can be divided and sent like like multiple packets, like and they arrive like as soon as they arrive to 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 receiver, like they will be put back together. So that's why I'm asking because you said like only 140 characters yeah. will be able to fit. Well, one. yeah, if you remember, or you know, many of you may not remember back when we had pagers, um, but the pager network was totally separate from um, the internet. Okay, uh, I will give you a, a war story. During 9-11, when um, the planes hit the three locations, the World Trade Center, two towers, and the Pentagon, I was in the Pentagon. And everybody and his brother exited the Pentagon, and we were standing out in the Pentagon parking lots, and everybody was trying to get on their phones. They were trying to send texts or they were trying to make phone calls or whatever and the cellular towers became absolutely saturated so nobody got on. Everybody's phone stopped working um, and it was because you know the cell tower which could handle like 2,000 simultaneous connections had 10,000 people trying to connect and it just the, the whole cell tower arrangement stopped, but at the same time, I had on my hip a two-way pager that had email, and that email, no matter how long I typed an email message, broke it down into 140 character packets and translated it to internet somewhere over there, in other words, not stuck in our cellular bubble like we were in the south parking lot so I could do email but I could not do email from this guy and I could not make phone calls and I could not make SMS texts because everybody was hammering the towers that's called distributed denial of service it was unintentional but that was a DDoS attack if you think about it so my two-way pager was the only way that I could communicate and uh, as we were leaving the Pentagon area, uh, like 12 of us got on this one big bus, and they said, we're going to Roslyn. Who wants to go? They had commandeered one of the metro buses, and you know, about a dozen of us jumped onto it and said, I'll go to Roslyn. What they were doing was they were trying to get us away from the Pentagon to a metro station. And so the, it took us four hours to get from the Pentagon to the Roslyn Metro. Now that is about three miles, if that gives you an idea. It took us four hours to get three miles. So we were sitting in traffic the whole time. The thing is, while we were in traffic, these still didn't work. So we were sort of locked in this bubble and nobody got communication about anything except me and my little two-way pager. So I had a friend over at IDA, the Institute for Defense Analysis, and he was on the Presidential Commission with me. He was our chief of staff, and he was over at IDA, and he notified everybody who was on the President's Commission about what was going on. And I typed in my own little messages to him, and he would broadcast, broadcast that to everybody from the President's Commission. You know, Scotty's there, he's okay, that sort of thing. But then he would send updates down to me and I would get these email updates on my little two-way pager and my pager would go off and everybody in the bus would lean over to listen to me sharing news about what was going on. So always remember, you're not stuck unless you only have one means of communication. I had my cell phone, nobody's cell phone worked. I had my two-way pager on my hip and it worked. 
So that was our means of communicating. So side trip there, but always remember that you can use different ways. And just because, you know, other people may turn up their noses on them, it doesn't matter. Do what works best for you. That's why I have my amateur radio license. And that's why I carry a radio with me that I have set up to hit any of the local repeaters wherever I'm at. And all I have to do is give my call sign and I'm connected to ham radio enthusiasts in that local area. And they're like over 20 repeaters in the DC metro area, over 20 of them, all operated by amateurs and volunteers. So anyway, so we're doing the two-factor authentication uh, and SMS hijacking can occur. That's the, the main problem. And that's why they say SMS texts aren't great for 2FA. However, this is a, a description of it. it. You are trying to log in. An SMS text goes to something you have, not something you know. So that is the second factor, something you have. You're carrying your cell phone. And it sends you a code. Um, I get those codes all the time. I'm logging in here, pops up and says, was that you? Yep. Uh, or whatever. So uh, that's using the Google Authenticator. But here's the bottom line from ZDNet. They said SMS-based two-factor authentication is absolutely better than not having two-factor authentication at all. Absolutely better. Because it adds that additional factor. Okay, so if that's all you got, use it. It's better than not doing two-factor authentication at all. All right, so first of all, use text-based MFA if you can. And like many of the things, uh, Nerman, you sort of, you're using your, um, your WatchGuard authenticator. That's fine, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. There are two alternatives to SMS-based two-factor codes. One is called an authenticator app, and that's your WatchGuard, Norman. Um, but there are also other ones, Microsoft, Google, 2FA. It's actually called 2FA. It's a, a, a brand name called 2FA. But there are lots of different authenticators that you can use. Many are free. These three are free. Uh, but if you can't decide, this came straight from HP. Hewlett Packard said, Microsoft Authenticator is hands down the best authenticator app available. I think that's pretty strong uh, confirmation that you can use the Microsoft Authenticator app. Okay? So, number one, if you don't use SMS-based, use an authenticator app. How many of you guys have authenticators loaded on your cell phones? You know, and Nerman, you were going to ask a question or something? Yeah, I just want to add, like, if you're using, like, password, pa password manager, so you can also uh, uh, attach to your uh, passwords and uh, usernames. You can uh, attach uh, um, F -M -F -M -F -F -M uh, MFA. Uh, so I'm using Keeper. And it's really easy. So, like, you go, like, you open your 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 um, username for specific website. Let's say again, Facebook. So you go to your uh, Facebook username and password, and there is option to add a token. Uh, and it's really easy. And you can add for each whatever you have there. Like, so if you have like thirty different passwords and usernames, if you can add. Uh, token and it's it's amazing mm -hmm. it's easy now um, while we're talking about it and it's I think it's a good place to start I have a Google Authenticator and I've got four accounts hooked up to my Google Authenticator for example um, but you could put all sorts of accounts on there however some people may not understand that um, your Google Authenticator, your Microsoft Authenticator, uh, in this case the 2FA Authenticator, how is it that you can use any Authenticator you want? 
Any thoughts on that? How, how is it that Microsoft and Google can both do the same thing using different apps? And yet it'll work for your Facebook, or it'll work for your LinkedIn, or it'll work for your um, Gmail, or whatever. Any thoughts on that? Okay. It's called open source. Open source, there's actually something out there, and I believe it's called open auth, O-P-E-N-A-U-T-H, that is open source for um, multi-factor authentication, and the source code is made available to anybody. That's how come there are so many different authenticator apps because they speak to each other. Um, if you are within your enterprise, you could, you could have something um, like um, within your enterprise, there are other uh, authenticator uh, uh, passing typically referred to as Radius or Kerberos. If you want to look those up, Radius or R-A-D-I-U-S or Kerberos, which is the name of the three-headed dog, uh, but Kerberos is another one. Those are typically for your enterprise, but OpenAuth is for outside the enterprise. And it, it just passes credentialing authentication, and it says this account or this object is given permission here, and that's okay with me. So somebody else over here says, is that account okay? And this guy vouches and says, yes, it's okay. All right? So open auth is the means that you can use any authenticator you want, and it'll work. It's called open auth. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. But it's open source where these things pass between each other and say, yes, it's okay. All right, so that's just a, a little side trip there. But authenticator apps are the uh, second most secure. If you're not going to do SMS-based, get an authenticator. And you notice I've got some of my stuff turned on with uh, Google Authenticator. I've got other stuff where it actually contacts me directly and says, is that you? However it works, please do it. A user ID and password are not considered secure anymore. And what's the third third option? Anybody? Third option besides authenticator apps and SMS based. Tokens. These are actual hardware keys that you can get. And probably the most famous one is called UB key. Y U B I keys. And you buy a key. I think they're like $45 or something. You buy a key and you plug it into your USB port and it literally uses that key as your other factor. So it's sort of like carrying your um, driver's license or something like that. It's something that you have. And that's why uh, they use it. And that is... Uh, by far the most secure way of doing it. Because if you don't have your key, you're out of luck. If you lose it, you're out of luck. <laughs> okay, so most people would take something like this and put it on their keychain. And, you know, if I, if I can't drive home, I'm, not, I'm in trouble. So they carry it with their keys. But that's the third way. So um, if you're working on MFA, at all, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, CISA recommends that you use this site called Lock Down Your Login. I will share this on our Facebook page, but it's called Lock Down Your Login, and there are numerous places that recommend it. So if you do a search for Lock Down Your Login, you will see a lot of people, you know, UC Santa Barbara or whatever, they'll all say, use this page. And it shows you how to enact MFA on dozens of different accounts, how to turn on MFA for LinkedIn, how to do it for your bank, how to do it for your 401k, how to do it for your, you know, whatever. They're all on there. 
So you can literally say, oh, I've got a, I don't know, Fidelity 401k. That'll tell you how to enact multi-factor authentication on that particular site. And here's my white hat suggestion. If it's good for you, it's good for those around you. If you are all safe and secure using your, you know, third party authenticators and multi-factor authentication and stuff, but your spouse is not, but your parents aren't, but your kids aren't, but your broke brother-in-law isn't, <laughs> you're, you're only protecting yourself. So be a good white hat and help others achieve MFA as well. It also gives you great practice because you're doing it for free. You're doing it as a favor for them. But it is really important that you work on it. So if you just can't bring yourself to do MFA, stop with the passwords and start using passphrases. It's not as good as any of the MFA approaches that we've discussed. But if you just can't bring yourself or your parents or whatever to do MFA, teach them to use passphrases. And if that's still, you know, you're still drawing blanks, down at the bottom here is a passphrase generator. And, you know, if you look over here uh, on the right, Truffle scoured bulginess unfair. <laughs> and of course, you'd add, you know, numbers or special characters or whatever, but that's a passphrase. As compared to 49 Lake Street, that's a password. Monkey 99, you know. No idea what that one is. These guys are murder to re remember. These guys, not so much. And if you use a passphrase and toss in another character, like a number and or a special character, like an exclamation point, just so you know, uh, brute force password crackers know, and they are programmed to uh, first try exclamation points in their brute force password attacking. So maybe you want to use another special character. Just a thought. Like uh, John the Ripper, uh, it recognizes that many people use things like 1234 at the end of their passphrase or an exclamation point at the end of their passphrase or an exclamation point at the beginning of their passphrase. Why? Human nature. It's what we do psychologically. It's easier for you to say my passphrase and then something special or something special and my passphrase. So John the Ripper and other brute force password crackers um, do take that into account and they will try, you know, to, uh, to guess using your special characters at the beginning or the end of the text stream. So just something to think about. Put it in the middle, maybe. Any questions? Anybody have any comments on this? Was this helpful? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to ask, like, I was thinking about, like, talking, like, device that you, you just uh, purchased. Like, uh, I'm just thinking, like, if, if someone get access to that or you, like you said, yeah, you, you, I was thinking to purchase one for, for my, they have also that option for watch card and you can get your uh, USB, but what do you think, how secure is that? Well, um, the, the important thing to ask yourself is, what am I trying to protect? Um, so if, for example, you're trying to protect your retirement accounts, that's a pretty big deal. But if you're trying to protect your LinkedIn account, maybe not so much. Um, so I have toyed for years with buying myself a separate um, token, um, but I still haven't gotten around to it. Uh, there's also 
Um, if any of you are familiar with the movie Catch Me If You Can, remember that? And it talks about that, that guy that forged money um, and, you know, played like he was a airplane pilot, actually first officer, I think is what he said he was, and a, an attorney and a doctor and all these sorts of things. Um, th that movie is based on a true story of Frank Abagnale. Well, Frank Abagnale has actually joined a company that uses, and I don't have it with me, I'm sorry, but on the back of everyone's driver's license is a barcode. Frank Abagnale says, you already have this, so use this instead. And you put in your user ID and password and scan your barcode on your driver's license because there's only one of your driver's license barcodes out there. And he was so, helping banks to, uh, to, to clear those checks. Yep. Yeah, yeah he, he spent time in jail yeah. and they gave him a good behavior time off because he was so good at forgery that the FBI would literally come into the prison and consult with him and hand him multiple bills and he'd go, this is the bad one. <laughs> and they'd go, what? How did you know that? He was just so good at it. Uh, if you ever want to see a tremendous, um, they're called Google Talks, Google Talks. I think Frank Abagnale did one in 2013 or 2014 um, that is well worth watching, where he talked a little bit about what he did, but then he talked about forgery and why all of our new bills look the way they do. Uh, but then he also talks about things like this this thing he does, and I forgot the name of it, but Frank Abagnale recommends things like having, you know, use the barcode on the back of your driver's license. You carry it with you. Why not just scan it? Makes perfect sense. Everybody has one unless you're under 16. So anyway, just something to, to think about. Uh, anybody else have anything? We're uh, at the end of our time. Okay. I appreciate it very much. You guys have been wonderful. And I appreciate, uh, oh, Chris had to run. All right, gotcha. So everybody have a great one. And we will see you next Saturday. Please post on Facebook. Love hearing from you guys. Uh, Nerman, great stuff. Keep at it and keep sharing. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. See you next uh, Saturday. All right, guys. Take care.